So we've now seen how RSA works and we've also elaborated quite a bit on what it means and how we can be sure that when we pick odd numbers and we want them to be prime, that they are actually are proven to be prime. So I've seen primality tests and seen primality proofs. Now we're switching to the attacker view and we're looking into how we can factor a number. And so, well, let's get this naively. So what do you know about factorization? You know how to try small numbers. You try a division by two, division by three. So a method called trial division. Um, well, yeah, you know that prime numbers get more and more rare because, I mean, after five, seven, then nine is skipped already, so it's not every odd number. And you do see that the number sparse out a little bit. There's a theorem which um, de describes the way that these prime numbers are distributed. So the prime number theorem says that the number of primes up to n is something like n divided by log n, so natural logarithm of n. So this tells you both about how many numbers they are, so if you want to choose primes, but also how sparse these get. So at the beginning, log n is very small, and so afterwards, log n grows with n, so on average, you're getting fewer and fewer primes. Now, is that good enough to just say, oh, well, if all she's picking is 2048 bit primes, I'll just try them all. Okay, so how many 2048 bit primes are there? Well, let me look at how many primes are there in total. That would be 2 to the 48, 2048 divided by natural logarithm of 2048. And then I only want 2048 bit numbers. So I'm removing those which have 2048, 47 and fewer bits. So taking this difference here, the second part is taking care that I'm not taking any numbers which have fewer bits. This is a pretty big number. This is on the scale of 10 to the 600. So if I need to try all of those numbers, there is no chance. This is a really, really large number. Remember cryptographic size for symmetric key, we've seen 128 bits or 256. This is way, way larger than this. So this is certainly not how we're choosing our primes for attacks. I mean, Child division is certainly not the attack that they're choosing primes for, but also if you're kind of uncomfortable, like, should I make another RSA key because, I mean, there are only so many primes, maybe I'll have an overlapping prime, you're not going to run out of primes. There are enough primes for everybody. There are 7 billion people. These are way more than 7 billion primes. Um, so trial factorization is not the method of choice to break RSA number, surprise, surprise, but it's actually a useful step when you're factoring normal numbers. So if you're looking at like how likely is a number to divide by 2, well, it's 50% if you're meeting a normal number, like garden variety number, not an RSA modulus. So for those numbers, trial factorization is useful um, because you don't actually want to deal with a big machinery in order to find something as trivial as a factor of 2. So when you're looking at RSA numbers, you actually have a whole lot of machinery in there. And so we're going to look through different types of factorization methods. Trial factorization, not going to expand on that more, um, but that takes care of all small factors. Then there's a batch that this is what this and the next video we are about is medium factors. We're going to see next the polar row method. Yes, another polar row. Um, and we're going to see in the other video, video 5, the p minus 1, p plus 1, and the elliptic curve method of factorization. So those are good for medium sized factors. This is still not what you use for breaking RSA numbers. If you're actually going for large factors, RSA numbers being characterized by having two huge primes, well, just the product of two huge primes, then you want to use the number field set. And now within the number field set, we're going to see some sieves up to the number field sieve, and then I wave my hands on saying, okay, here are some details that change for the number field sieve. We're not going to go into all the details because it's an active area of research. Um, so I'm just going to give you the yeast of it. Um, so in the number field sieve, you're actually turning the one hard factorization into many, many, many smaller factorizations. And these are not so much smaller by bit length, but these are normal numbers. So this is just turning a factorization of n. So I'm going to use n for the RSA numbers. These are the hard to factor numbers. And I'm going to use m if I want to indicate, well, it's a number which I need to factor, it's my target here, but um, it doesn't have any restrictions against 
say, the integers of word 2, 3, 5, and so on. Now, when I look at this machinery I have here, I will be using trial factorization in order to get rid of the very small factors. So when I get to the next method, so when I go for Paul zero, I do assume that factors of 2 and, say, 3 are already removed from the number. So m is typically an odd number without very small prime divisors, but it's also not a prime number. There's another one which is similar to tri trial factorization, which is called sieving, and that is actually what the number for sieve comes from and what the other sieves have in their name. Um, that is another way of getting rid of the small factors. So you have seen the sieve of Eratosthenes in the proof that there are infinitely many primes. You're taking, well, you're writing all, all the numbers, then you're finding, okay, the smallest number, larger than one, is two, and then you're taking every second number and cross it out, because every second number is divisible by two. And then you're moving up to the next number, which hasn't been crossed out, that's three, and then you're jumping at steps of three and crossing out numbers. So six, well, six has already been crossed out. Nine, well, that's a new number. Twelve has already been crossed out. So you're jumping by steps of three. Then the next number you haven't crossed out is five, etc., etc. Similarly, these sieves uh, deal with small factors by doing regular jumps and removing those or noting that there is a factor of two in there, three in there, and so on. And then we're using these above methods to find the medium-sized factors. And then finally, in the number field sieve, we also have a final stage where we actually have to do something in our algebra. Then I see all these ingredients. But this is just to motivate that looking at factorization methods for medium-sized factors actually matters. Now, the reasons that our RSA numbers are so large, I mean, the key I showed you in the example was 2048. That's still the default for PGP. I uh, recommend you use 4006 if you're making a PGP key. Uh, the reason that we have to choose in so large is that this number field sieve has sub-exponential complexity. So this is something which is faster to break than anything exponential. So it doesn't grow with two, um, the bit length, so two to the bit length to some power, like scroll attacks. It grows faster than that. So we have to more than double the bit length if you want to make the attack twice as hard. All right, well, the first one we're going to see actually is an exponential attack. So let me jump into the power draw method. And let me start with this maybe surprising fact. So if I define a walk, so this row 0, row 1, row 2, and so on, where each step is defined by taking the previous step, squaring it, and adding 11. OK, so this is getting me integers. They get larger each time I square and adding 11. And if I take then this s there, which is a very large number, I'm taking s well, OK, maybe each of them is not so large because I'm taking differences. I'm taking the first step minus the second step. I'm taking the second step minus the fourth step. Third step minus the sixth. You already see that in the indices, I'm again having i and 2i running around there. So this should remind you of, of Floyd. Um, but let's just look at this number. Well, OK, the previous step is smaller than the next time, so there will be some negative signs coming in. But in the end, it's an integer. This integer has lots of prime factors. This integer is actually divisible by every prime up to 2 to the 20. It's not a surprise that, say, 3 divides it. Every, set, every third number is divisible by 3, so no surprise there. But having a number which has 20 bits divided, that is more unusual. I mean, it's a big number, but still, even for big numbers, finding so large prime divisors is unusual. There even are some primes which are larger than 2 to the 20, which are divisors of s. Now, let me turn this into a factorization algorithm. So for every p that divides this s, if I'm taking the GCD of s with m, then if this p also divides m, then it's also divisor of a GCD. Well, obviously, if it's divisor of s, it's a divisor of m, and it's also divisor of the GCD. Now, that means, assuming that there is some other stuff in M which is not also dividing S, that means if you take this GCD of S with M and then com compute it, that P will separate from some other parts in M. So this is how we can find factors up to the 20 in M and leaving 
larger factors in M intact. Now, how to compute this S? The way I've written it there, well, the largest index is this 7000. Now, I have to do that many steps. So for each step, I have to do a square. And I also have to compute this product. So I need about 2 to the 14 steps. So this is a number which is, well, it's, this is 2 to the 13, this is 2 to the 14. So that many squarings and then a whole bunch of multiplications to get this. Now, in the end, I don't actually need S as this huge number. I will compute a GCD with S and M. So I can do all of these steps modulo M, keep the numbers somewhat smaller, because the first step in a GCD computation is reducing this S mod M. So I might as well do the S computation mod M to begin with. Okay, I'm also writing that I need very little memory. You have already seen Paul draw for some other methods, so let me do this quickly, but I should highlight this here. So the way that I actually compute this S is I'm computing two walks, a slow walk, row i and a fast walk row 2i. Okay, so for every step I'm advancing one by one, the other one by two. So I'm doing row i, row 2i, row i plus one, row 2i plus two, etc. At every step when I have those I compute the difference and I multiply this into s. Everything mod m. So I now have the slow walk, the fast walk and s. So three integers mod m that counts as very little memory. Now, if I would be trying to find all the primes up to 2 to the 20 by trial division, then I would probably need something on the scale of 2 to the 16. Because, I mean, I have to go up 2 to the 10, and then taking how many primes there are, each of those, well, the numbers 2 to the 10, each of those um, needing a trial division, so I would need 2 to the 16 trial division to find all these numbers. So that is somewhat faster, and it's also easier. I don't need to know those primes. I mean, maybe the primes up to 2 to the 20 I can still tabulate, but this method doesn't require me to know the primes in advance. So I don't need to do this as a trial division. I can just use this row method. So I'm going to do this walk, this row squared plus 11 mod m for factoring m. So every step is a computation mod m. Now, this 3,575 is a choice which I can motivate because, well, this is how far it needs to go in order to find all the primes up to 2 to the 20. But in general, I don't even know how large I have to go. So how do I choose this, this stopping point? So I'm going to go in my S all the way up to row sub S and row sub, two, uh, row sub Z, row sub 2Z, and then compute the GCD with M. Again, the M already appears before in the reduction steps. But how large do I choose this S? Let us see. Okay, let's analyze what's happening in there. So here's again the question. I want to find all the primes up to some bound y. On the previous slide I've chosen y to be 2 to the 20, but in general there's some bound y and I want to capture all the primes up to y. Well, what does Paul Drow actually do? Let's look at a prime that we're finding. So we're looking at a prime p, which will be found by this. Then I'm also looking at this whole walk modulo p. And then these rows, these steps, taking the previous one squared plus 11, well, we're now looking instead of mod m, which is a multiple of p, we're now looking at mod p. And so each of those row i's is a number mod p. Okay, there are p numbers mod p, so I'm expecting collision, expecting the same number mod p to appear twice. And that's again the Brewster paradox, and so after square root of p, uh, pi p over two steps. Okay, so let's go back to this picture that we all know and love. So here we have our row method picture. Um, now this picture is actually not the walk row, it is the walk row mod p. So this would be the walk modulo p, and we have entered the circle. This is something on the scale of square root of p steps. So we are done here, we have found a collision. But in this case, we don't actually see the collision. We're working modulo M. Oh, sorry, that's a typo. We're working modulo M, not modulo, modulo P. So we don't know P. I mean, if you would know P, we don't need to factor M anymore. 
but we do know that P divides this GCD. So what we could be doing is we compute a whole bunch of GCDs. So we're doing a step and then we take the difference of this new step with every old step and we're computing the GCD. That will enable us to find the collision as soon as it happened. So then we are running around this walk and now we're encountering the same point twice for the first time and well the i, the previous number, was here and the j is once around the circle as well and then we're seeing our p as a device. So that would work, it would find p, but let's look at the complexity of this. I'm expecting to take square root of p steps. Let me forget about the constant there. So I would need to have square root of p many elements stored there. And so getting towards the last step, I would be doing the GCD of this number that just came in with each of the previous numbers. So that is square root of p GCDs, square root of p times. That would be a computation which is on the scale of p. Well, that is as bad as trial division, actually a bit worse, because they could stop after half the bit length. So I don't, certainly don't want to do that. So multiple things here. One is I don't want to have every difference. As before, I want to use Floyd. So I'm only going to look at selected differences and accepting that instead of finding the first collision, I'm going to find that I'm in a circle in a cycle somewhat later. So I'm going to look not at every difference here, not at i and j. I'm looking at k and 2k. And then the other part is the GCD computation is actually more expensive than the update in the row method. The update in the row method is just one squaring mod m, whereas the GCD computation is something which is, well, of a complexity which is logarithmic even higher. So I also should be skimping down on how many GCD computations I'm doing. So the reason for computing this s here and including all of those. Well, if I do the GCD with S, I'm implicitly doing a GCD with each of these steps. So part one, I'm using Floyd because I can't afford to do these square root of P times square root of P many differences. I only want to do, well, square root of P steps. And so these are square root of P steps. And also this is a product with square root of P elements, but it's only one product. So it's not an extra square root of P. So I'm having square root of p steps, square root of p products, and again remember that with Floyd we don't find the first collision, we find a collision later, well exactly where for k which is in this multiple of k of z, so if, if i and g match then I find k at j minus i times an integer and it has to be at least as large as i and at least as large as j. Okay, we have seen Floyd before so I think this should be fine, but you can you should go through this again. Okay, so we have to go a bit further than the square root of p both for the factor to pi over two here and for having the Floyd. So while the square root of p for primes up to two to the twenty, that would have just been two to the ten. I'm actually going to two to the fourteen, so this extra well with k, well with the z here, I'm only going to two to the thirteen, so this extra factor of 2 to the 3, this extra factor of 8 there, is to take care of all the other stuff, of the slowdowns because of Floyd, of the pi over 2, etc. And in general, since this is a big computation, you typically want to overshoot a little bit. So this is the, so the, the growth of this uh, z is like y to the square root, so square root of y, y to the 1 half, that would be the 2 to the 10. But then there is this little o of 1 coming in here. So this little o of 1 is this extra plus 3 in the exponent that we have seen now. And in general, this requires some fine tuning, some trials, and well, you can also do a split. You can do the first z computation, then you do the next z computation. So you can do intermediate GCDs, see whether it worked already. If not, continue. But with that computation, you're guaranteed to find every prime so that, well, it's less than y, so that, well, the z is a, so that the s is a multiple of it. So follow row is a very easy method that is guaranteeing you, with the right little o of 1, that you're going to find all the small primes.
So after you've run power draw, you're guaranteed, well, with the right tuning, you're guaranteed that there is no more prime up to 2 to the 20. So when you get to the next steps of the cofactorization, then you can already assume that there's nothing small running on.